Hello and welcome to the Figgy Art Museum's Virtual Thursdays at the Figgy series. My name is Melissa Moore and I'm Director of Education at the Figgy and I'm very happy you could join us tonight. For the time being, we're hosting these virtual programs on most Thursdays, so please check out the Figgy's website for information on upcoming programs. We're able to offer these at no cost to you thanks to the generous sponsorship provided by Chris and Mary Rayburn. Chris and Mary, thank you so much. While these programs are free to watch, I do encourage you to consider becoming a Figgy member. Your support as a member helps us continue to fulfill our mission of bringing art and people together, even during times like this when we can't necessarily be together in person. So a quick note about tonight. If you have any questions during the program, please enter them into the Q&A and we'll get to them during the latter portion of the program. So with that, let us begin. It is my pleasure to welcome Figgy Assistant Curator Vanessa Sage to the program this evening. Vanessa and the rest of the Figgy's curatorial team worked with the curators of For America to bring this stunning exhibition to our community. And if you haven't have had a chance to see it yet, trust me, it looks beautiful. So Vanessa, congratulations on the exhibition and thank you so much for joining us this evening to present your research on a rebel artist. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. Uh, and thank you, Melissa. So tonight I am going to be talking about uh, some groups of artists as well as individuals who divide, defied convention in different ways. Uh, some of them established alternative arts organizations in order to achieve their goals. And um, through those acts, uh, they really changed the course of art. Um, sometimes uh, this talk covers quite a time period, um, as does For America, which is about uh, 200 years um, in length. And I think there's some really interesting uh, cyclical things that uh, at least I see and I think other people can see uh, within art history, which um, you know, whether these artists are seeking uh, more independence from perhaps conservatism in the art world, um, they're going uh, against some problematic art world power structures, or they're seeking greater autonomy as artists, there seems to be this cycle that happens um, from progressive, from conservative to progressive, and then back again, as uh, things continue to move forward in the art world, um, from the traditional to the avant-garde. And so that's uh, one other element of this talk that I'll be covering uh, tonight. Um, I'll talk about uh, the repeated uh, splintering off of some art groups. Um, and how complicated and how fluid the art world really is. I think when uh, a lot of people think about art history, you think, you know, like one thing happened after the other, uh, but in reality, it was more fluid than that. And um, I hope that that comes across. Uh, this talk is not intended to be comprehensive. Uh, what I really wanted to do was get you thinking about um, perhaps artists that you don't think about in this way, um, but who, uh, and who also are connected in ways to themes addressed in For America. Uh, one of those themes would be how organizations, arts organizations evolve over time, as well as issues related to representation and uh, diversity, which I'll get into a little bit later in the talk. Uh, so first of all, I thought I would discuss a little bit more about what exactly I mean by rebel artists. And I, I know that can be sort of a, a loaded term, but in, in structuring the talk, I'm really using that term to describe artists who challenge the status quo in some way. Um, some of these instances may, you know, seem mild, uh, respective to others, while others are perhaps more dramatic, and there's certainly a range. There are also many um, successful and well-known artists who worked within the accepted modes um, and structures at various points in their lives, um, but then at other points, um, there was something that they pushed back against in order to achieve their goals as artists. 
and make the changes that they wanted either to create the artwork that they wanted or to address um, some issues that would make it um, more open for other people to create and exhibit the artwork that they wanted to. So the theme for this talk was inspired by the founding of the National Academy of Design. Uh, so I thought it'd be great to start there. Uh, it was founded in 1825 when a group of artists banded together to um, pursue better uh, opportunities than they were being, they, they were receiving at the existing American Academy of Fine Arts. Uh, they wanted to create better conditions, not just for this for themselves, but also uh, for the development and the progression of American art um, in a in a young nation. At the time, there were thirty artists. Uh, Samuel F. B. Morse, who you'll see on the left hand side of the screen, uh, was one of the founders of the organization. And on the right is a portrait of John Trumbull, who was the president of the older established organization, the American Academy of Fine Arts, uh, which had been founded in 1802. So the existing academy was known for being a more uh, conservative organization. Um, they uh, promoted classicism. As I mentioned, the president uh, uh, was John Trumbull. And if you are familiar with his work, he is best known for four large history paintings in the Capitol Rotunda uh, that depict uh, moments before, during, and after the Revolutionary War, uh, including uh, the famed painting of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. So think highly finished think realistic, think historical, um, uh, think classicism. So these are the things that were being promoted at the American Academy of Fine Arts. And apparently John Trumbull was a bit of a tyrant towards the students. Um, and the training of artists mainly consisted of them copying from plaster casts and copying from paintings um, with limited guidance from those in charge. So there was this issue that the students didn't feel like their needs were being met. And in addition to this, um, there was inconsistent access provided to the antique casts, which were considered a, a essential part of their training. And so um, due to these, it was these reasons, these unsatisfactory conditions, um, that Samuel F. B. Morse, Asher B. Durand, and Thomas Cole, among others, founded the New York Drawing Association. And through that association, they were able to meet and, and draw and tr get some of the professional artistic development that they, didn't, they were not receiving at the existing academy. Now, uh, there was some attempts at reconciliation, but in 1826, they, the younger group of artists officially broke from the older one and formed the National Academy of Design. So it was this new organization was uh, one founded for artists, by artists. They wanted to, quote, promote the fine arts in America through instruction and exhibition. And as a result of all these uh, younger artists uh, going to this, this newer startup, the older academy uh, lost its membership and eventually had to close in 1841. Uh, so I think uh, this is also paralleled um, in some of the things I'll talk about later, but also just in general that it demonstrates the need um, not only to evolve among arts organizations, um, but also to, to reevaluate how things are being done within them. So after that initial break from the older organization and uh, the National Academy of Design, it gained prominence. It supported the rise of the Hudson River School, which is known for being the first American school of landscape painting. 
it was the place to be to have your work shown as an artist it was it was prestigious uh, and as you can see here there's two examples uh, one from 1870 and one from 1882 about you know from its founding in the 1820s as a as a startup organization um, to what it had become uh, a few short you know around 50 years later um, so it was the place for the elite of New York to come see artwork um, artists uh, would you know very very much hope to be exhibited at their exhibitions and the image on the left is a varnishing day which after the artists the artists had to physically submit uh frames paintings that they wanted um, to be considered for the annual exhibition and then they would be informed by letter whether they were going to be included and then they would be able to come uh to something known as varnishing day which was when they could go in see where their work was hung put finishing touches on it and make it look all shiny with a, a layer of varnish on the right you can see you know the those fair and fashionable individuals viewing the artwork now as i mentioned earlier um, a, a lot of this talk is going to be uh, concerning that cycle that happens throughout art history and although the academy you know it was it was successful in many ways there were some splinter groups that um, soon uh, splintered off of the national academy of design for various reasons so the academy started uh, as a startup um, by 30 artists who banded together and then they grew into something that was more established, prominent, and very well known. And then as other tendencies began to develop among artists, there's this push and pull between the traditional and the new. And um, I'll talk a little bit about that now. So in 1875, the Art Student League uh, was formed by a group of artists, many of whom were students at the National Academy of Design. Um, so you have a, a, another group breaking from an older organization. Many of these artists uh, were women. Uh, the reasons that they broke off from the academy uh, were multiple so there were rumors that the national academy would be canceling some courses due to money issues uh, that would have forced students to not be able to draw from life for a while in addition to that some of the younger artists uh, wanted to pursue um, some more modern styles that were not being uh, promoted or accepted at the academy now the league operated uh, after it was established in 1875 the league operated in a system of studios and uh, this example on the left is a, is a good example so this is augustus st gaudens and the way it was set up is there were these different studios and they were led by individual artists and the administration of the league um, did not dictate what was being, um, you know, what was being taught by the instructors. So there, they didn't interfere. So in that way, the students could select an instructor that they they wanted to pursue uh, the kind of work that that instructor was known for making. And so in that way, the student could could pick somebody who was maybe working in a more uh, European uh, influenced way if they or expressive way and then they could uh, follow that up working directly with the artists now the league is uh, it's still active and it, there's a laundry list of very important artists who were students as well as instructors at the league some of them include 
Isabella Bishop, Jacob Lawrence, Romare Bearden. Um, many of them are featured in uh, the National Academicians Works on Paper exhibition at SIGI right now. Now, at this point, I'll also mention that some of these artists were active in multiple organizations. And so there are artists who not only taught at the league, but also taught at the National Academy as well over time. Now in 1877, there was yet again, another group that kind of split off um, from the Academy. And this was the Society of American Artists. Uh, they felt again that the Academy was a bit too conservative in what they were doing, specifically in terms of what was being accepted for exhibition in, in the annual exhibitions. And some of the artists active in the Society of American Artists included Albert Pinkham Ryder, uh, as well as Augustus St. Gaudens. And then 20 years after that, so uh, in 1877, the Society of American Artists formed. And then 20 years later, uh, another organization split off from that. And they, they formed the 10 American Painters in 1898. And these were artists that felt that the society uh, was not, uh, was, was hostile in some ways to Impressionism. And artists involved in the 10 American Painters include Child Hassam. So again, these transitions, um, as the artists uh, want to be able to exhibit and create the work that they want to, um, they band together and they, they split off from these other groups and then launch these independent exhibitions a lot of times um, as uh, venues for the work that they were producing so that people could see that work and they weren't being limited by what was being accepted uh, for exhibition in some of these other organizations. Another famed example uh, is the Armory Show of 1913. So this was a large modern art exhibition and it was organized by yet another organization so this is, I mean, you can really see how many of these different arts organizations are developing at this time. Uh, there's artists who are finding um, a common spirit with one another. And um, like I mentioned earlier, sometimes artists within these groups, they varied greatly in style in what they were doing, um, but they were seeking a, a way to exhibit their work and they found common ground with these other artists in terms of their goals and uh, would be able to come together and exhibit their work in, in these independent exhibitions. Uh, so this was organized, the Armory Show was organized by the Association of American Painters and Sculptors and uh, the exhibition had a massive impact um, on the art world. Uh, it included work by Ashkent artists as well as the European avant-garde. So there was a range, there was a great range of things happening within this exhibition. Uh, there was Fauvism, Cubism, Futurism, but there was also, like I mentioned, the Ashkent artists with uh, their realism. Now, this exhibition put a lot of artists on and critics on the offensive, um, like Kenyon Cox, who was both an artist and a critic. And he was also a, a national academician. And I found a statement that's quite dramatic by him that says, the cubists and futurists simply abolish the art of painting. They deny not only representation of nature, but also any traditional form of decoration. And he goes on to say, they maintain that they have invented a symbolism which expresses their individuality, or as they say, their souls. If they have really expressed their souls and the things that they show us, God help their souls. So it's a very dramatic critique and um, there's other language out there 
um, that to read now you can tell they're really you know amping it up and um, uh, so it was it was a big do and on the right there there's an image of the reaction at the art institute of chicago uh, where the armory show uh, also traveled and in reaction you have them burning some of the artwork in FNG, specifically a work by Matisse, as uh, they celebrate that it's it's going away. So there are some very strong reactions happening at this time to artists who are pushing into different and into new territory artistically. Now, I also want to mention about the the National Academy, like many, many other organizations, um, they've continued to evolve. And you can see this evolution uh, within For America. You can see it within the expansion of their membership uh, in terms of the art that the individuals who are uh, national academicians are creating, um, but also in terms of uh, representation of, within uh, the artistic body. And you can see that broadening uh, within For America of, uh, of the artists, as well as the different styles of realism as well. Um, so the Academy has, and it continues to evolve. Uh, so, and I think that's a really healthy, and so these, these artists um, that I've mentioned before who are breaking away and pushing against uh, established organizations in different ways, or maybe uh, pushing against uh, being limited by the kind of art that is accepted. Um, they're really pushing things uh, to grow and to, to shift and to change. And at various points, these changes have been spurred on by you know, specific artists, specific organizations, and in these past, uh, in this first part of the talk, I've been speaking specifically about um, stylistic and artistic uh, things that have been going on. But I also wanted to discuss um, the role of society and some of the things that were determining whether artists were allowed to exhibit or allowed entry into these organizations, what opportunities they were given, and talk about a couple of artists and organizations that through time um, that challenged those, uh, and also ones that once again started up their own organizations and held their own exhibitions in an effort uh, to support uh, a more uh, open environment for art. Um, so as I mentioned, there was this tension between the traditional and the avant-garde, uh, and that's not really new. And I'm going to get into um, some of those societal things that I was talking about in a moment here. But I wanted to also talk about um, the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, the Academy and the Salons in Paris and build up to some of those other things I'm going to talk about. Now, there was a great resistance to Impressionism as it was developing. Uh, the established uh, arts organizations in Paris they really controlled what was successful, what was accepted, uh, what was being taught. Uh, and now we look at Impressionism in a very positive light. I mean, when you think about Monet, Cezanne, and Renoir, they're, based, they're universally um, looked upon in a positive way. Um, but at the time of their emergence, um, there was a lot of resistance to that. So, the like I mentioned, there was this power structure in place, and the salon uh, 
really dictated the, the topic styles and the success of the artists, as well as them being able to sell their work uh, to the individuals who were coming to the salon. So it was about ex you know, exposure to potential buyers and the impressionists, and they wanted to make their art um, as they wanted, but they also wanted to be able to exhibit their work and to have the opportunity for the public to see and interact with their work. So in 1874, after, you know, they were not being accepted into the salon generally, and they decided, um, they being uh, individuals like uh, Claude Monet, uh, to have their an independent art exhibition. So in 1874, um, the Anonymous Society of Painters, Sculptors, and Printmakers, um, which included uh, Bert Morceau, uh, they had the exhibition, um, their independent art exhibition. And the initial responses, you can see some of what those consisted of in the cartoon on the right. Uh, by a cartoonist known as a shaman. And, uh, you know, basically that these uh, civilized, two civilized guys are just shocked by what they saw at the Impressionist exhibition and that it is terrorizing them, making them run away scared. Now, as I mentioned uh, before, there was a lot of marginalization during this period of, of certain individuals. Um, one example would be uh, women artists. So on the left, uh, you can see Madame Berteau and she founded it, the Union of Women Painters and Sculptors. So she was a women's rights activist and now, stylistically, this group of artists, they weren't necessarily, you know, radical or uh, in that way, um, but they really wanted to expand the opportunities uh, for women in the arts um, in France. And in terms of training, in terms of exhibition, um, in terms of prejudiced opinions towards their work at the salons, um, it was there were a lot of difficulties facing women artists at the time. And so Madame Berteau decided, first she opened a drawing workshop in 1873, and then she opened a sculpture school exclusively for women in 1880, and then finally founded the Union of Women Painters and Sculptors, which held annual exhibitions and had 450 members at its height. And while women did exhibit, they were able to exhibit at the salon, it was recognized that they were not given a fair shake in terms of the prizes. Uh, no women sat on the juries uh, for a long time. And so this um, female only exhibition, um, it was intended to be uh, non hierarchical. It also included decorative arts, which I think is wonderful. Um, and it, it gave these artists uh, access to exhibit. And um, now in addition to these efforts, in addition to starting uh, the union, uh, they also campaigned for um, women to be able to attend uh, the Ecole, as well as to have eligibility to compete for the Prix de Rome prize. And again, in something that is repeated, um, uh, in 1931, uh, there was a new group that was formed called the Femme Artiste Moderne, which was tired of the conservative practices of the older union. So you can see there's more of that um, cyclical thing happening where groups are splintering off of other groups. Now, another organization I'd like to mention uh, is the Royal Academy in London, which was led by artists and architects 
And interestingly, this was what served as a model for the National Academy of Design. Um, but once again, you see that there's uh, marginalization occurring, uh, you know, unsurprisingly during the time period. So in this painting, uh, you can see that the two women involved in the founding of the Royal Academy, uh, Angelica Kaufman and Mary Moser, they're pictured on the wall, um, on the top right of the wall, rather than among um, who should be their peers. And although the two women were involved in uh, founding the academy, uh, women were not admitted to the school until 1860. And the first uh, woman admitted to the school uh, was Laura Hereford on the right. And there's a really interesting story about how she actually was allowed entry into the academy is that she submitted drawings um, signed L. Herford. And so without her first name, uh, they assumed uh, that she was a man and she was admitted on the merits of her drawings uh, with a letter making the offer addressed to L. Herford Esquire. So in 1860, uh, she took up her place at the academy and then shortly after that, uh, there were 10 women artists at the Academy. And then, uh, you know, by the time of her death in 1870, there are about 40 women studying the full courses, um, including drawing from live models at the Academy. And here I wanted to call out um, some organizations uh, similar to the Union of Female Painters and Sculptors in France that were organized in these different um, countries that I've been talking about. Um, so in England, there was the Society of Women Artists and that was formed in 1855. And they're dedicated to celebrating and promoting fine art created by women. And then we have uh, the National Association of Women Artists, which is in the United States, founded in 1889. Um, and they're both still uh, in operation, visit their websites. So what I wanted to also bring bring this discussion more up into contemporary times, but still have it connect um, to some uh, for America and some national academicians, um, including Hale Woodruff, who you see on, on the right. So I wanted to talk about um, these more recent examples of alternative exhibitions of exhibitions that were formed because there weren't opportunities or uh, for individuals in the established, um, you know, whether it be academies, annual exhibitions, museums, etc. So Hale Woodruff, he is included in the, the National Academicians uh, Works on Paper exhibition. Um, He's a really important figure in American art and uh, specifically in bringing, um, you know, he started, he was at the uh, universe, Atlanta University uh, when he began an exhibition of contemporary African American art. And this provided a national forum when there had not been one before. Um, for artwork that in subjects uh, was marginalized in existing institutions. I also wanted to mention uh, Spiral, and this was formed in 1963 by artists including Romare Bearden and Hale Woodruff and Norman Lewis. And uh, they gathered together to figure out a way to attend the March on Washington 
And they also discuss the role of artists within uh, the civil rights movement. Um, they experimented with different forms of um, expression within their work. And from Spiral, it, the name was meaning, uh, it symbolized their group as from a starting point, moving outward, embracing all directions, yet constantly upward was kind of the concept between of that group. And so they were, they were really addressing how artists uh, would be involved with the civil rights movement, um, as well as different forms of expression that they wanted to pursue. And then I also wanted to mention um, another group that developed called the Black Emergency Cultural Coalition. And so these groups are, uh, I mean, they're a little bit different than the ones I had talked about earlier. Um, I think there's, uh, you could, they're artists and they're also activist groups. And so the Black Emergency Cultural Coalition was organized in 1969 by artists in response to uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Arts exhibition, Harlem on My Mind, uh, which omitted African-American painters and sculptors who were active in the Harlem community. And they protested against that exhibition. Um, Benny Andrews was involved in the formation of the BECC and of those protests. And the goal of the group was to agitate for change in art museums, specifically in New York City, um, for representation of African American artists, but also um, African American curatorial, um, that it, their curatorial presence be established. On the right, there is a poster for a rebuttal to the Whitney Museum exhibition. And so this is another example of artists who are, are pushing against things the way that the way things are um, to to better things. So this the original exhibition um, at the Whitney, um, they refused to appoint a black curator for their survey of contemporary black artists in America. So in response to that, uh, there was the 1971 exhibition rebuttal to the Whitney Museum exhibition, which was organized by the BECC. Uh, another more uh, contemporary example that I think would be great to talk about is the Guerrilla Girls. Um, so beyond the discussions that, uh, you know, of the National Academy of Design, um, the Guerrilla Girls have challenged a variety of arts organizations and uh, they're an activist group and you can see some of their posters up on the screen that are calling out the way things are operating. And uh, they wear uh, gorilla masks in public and they're, they're continue, they continue to be active now, um, calling out organizations, calling out galleries, calling out uh, museums and publicly exposing what they um, see as discriminatory practices and um, trying to get a different institutional change to occur um, by recognizing what is going on in these different organizations. Now, in addition to the Gorilla Girls, I wanted to mention um, some more recent examples, uh, specifically of works being pulled in protest. Um, so uh, one good example is the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts which is a, a very uh, respected institution um, in the United States, one of the oldest and most important, arguably. Um, more than a dozen students uh, decided to pull their work out of the 2020 annual student exhibition in reaction to the school's handling of, the, of Black Lives Matter uh, demonstrations. 
And then there are other instances where artists have pulled their work out of exhibitions and protests at the Whitney or at MoMA PS1. Uh, so this is another example of artists that are um, you know, taking part in these acts to try to, to uh, bring up issues that need to, they feel need to be addressed within organizations and also to make change happen. So in conclusion, um, I know this is kind of a, you know, there, there is a lot covered in this talk, um, but generally I think it really, some of the things that we, that I talked about uh, are meant to show how different artists and groups of artists uh, through time uh, have spurred change in different ways and also why uh, they tried to make those changes, what it was that they were trying to do uh, with these organizations that they, they formed, these exhibitions that they held. And I also hope that it demonstrates the, you know, how healthy it is to have this back and forth um, between, you know, to continually be pushed to do, to do better, to re-examine how things are being done, uh, you know, what we're doing now, as well as to think about uh, the future of our organizations. And with that, I'm going to end and then can do questions if anyone has any. Vanessa, before we jump up to questions, I just want to thank you so much for sharing this. Uh, and I want to reiterate, yes, every day we can all strive to do better. I think that this program was a wonderful overview of some of the familiar and an even better overview of some of the things that are really going to get us thinking or continue to have us thinking as we, we move through our days, weeks, and, and certainly the rest of this exhibition and beyond. There, as you mentioned, there was a lot of information that you covered. So for our viewers, if you would like to go back and watch any of this, we are posting these programs on the Figgy's YouTube channel. We usually get them up there within about 24 hours. So you're welcome to go back and, and watch again. I don't see any questions coming through at this time. Just a reminder, you can type those into the Q&A box if you have them for Vanessa. Otherwise, watch it again. And you all received the link from me through email today. So you'll be able to email me any questions that you have and I can make sure Vanessa gets Let's see. We do have a couple comments here in the chat, Vanessa. Oh, just a, a big congratulations and, and thank you. An excellent job tracing the history of rebel artists and movements. A lot of appreciation there. And then um, a question here. Do you have a piece of art that you would consider the most radical in this particular show? The most radical work in For America. <laughs> I'm trying to think if there. You know, off the top of my head, I don't know how to um, make that, <laughs> you know, decision. <laughs> Well, no, that's that's understandable. Um, and I, you know, if you, if you do think of it, we can certainly send that out to the full group. Uh, I think that they'd probably enjoy that. I guess it depends on, yeah, uh, a definition. Oh, it, how, yeah, how, how are you, how, you know, how is it being defined as radical? Yeah. And like within the time, was it radical? Because there are some artists who, you know, within the time that they created the painting, even though uh, in their careers, they started off really pushing at the boundaries at the time that they created that work, it was, you know, within um, accepted modes, so. Right, or it may, if it was radical for the time, uh, it probably, it may seem tame today, or even exactly. uh, the antithesis of that. So a very good, a very good question there. Thank you. We do have a comment from one of our audience members. I think Whistler's red piece is radical. <laughs> so something for us all to consider. Um, if you do have any questions, go ahead and pop them in there. In the meantime, I wanted to share with you all in case you were not aware of this. Um, 
you know, of course, of course, you're you're aware that the museum is open to the public, and we encourage you to come and visit. We are requiring that you continue to wear a mask properly, no nose peepers, um, and that you uh, you stay socially distanced as you move through the museum. But for those of you who are not yet comfortable coming to the museum, we do have an alternative for you that isn't the same, but it gets really close. And that's our microsite, which we developed specifically for the exhibition for America. And so to access that, you can go to the Figgies website. If you click on the option of art in the menu bar, you go to art and then virtual exhibitions, there's going to be a link there that will take you to this um, entire recreation of the exhibition for America. You can move around just as if you were walking through the galleries. You can click on any of the artworks and learn more, read the label, or even for, for a lot of them, Vanessa has worked with regional artists and some of our educators on staff to create content that goes even, that takes you even further into exploring these artworks. So we do hope that you come and see the exhibition on view through May 16th, as you'll see on your screen. But if you're not yet ready to do that, or maybe you're, you know, you live afar, you're not here in the Quad City community, you check out our microsite, which you can access through the Figgies website by going to art, virtual exhibitions, and then for America. It, uh, we do have somebody here who's experienced it and had a wonderful time exploring the microsite. You'll also be able to go to the microsite and soon be and soon watch these program recordings too. Not only the ones from tonight, the one from tonight, but also from the rest of it. So thank you for that. Um, all right, Vanessa. I think with that, we're going to go ahead and wrap up for the evening. To our audience members, if you do have any burning questions that come to you in the middle of the night, you do. You have my email address. And Vanessa, I know we'll be happy to, to answer those for you via email. Um, you're going to check out the microsite. Hopefully, you're going to come to the museum and experience the, the exhibition in person before it leaves, if you're able to. And we do hope that you'll also join us for future programs. So those are listed on our website. Next week, for those of you who are Thursday program enthusiasts, next week, we're going to be hearing from Figgy Executive Director and CEO Michelle Hargrave, along with the Quad City Symphony Orchestra's Music Director and Conductor Mark Russell Smith for a one-of-a-kind program where art meets music. This program is also offered in conjunction with the Exhibition for America, and we hope you're able to join us for that very special evening. It'll happen online, same deal, you register online, uh, we'll send you a link before the program, and then we'll, I, we won't see you, but we'll know you're there, and we, we will hope that you enjoy it. So thank you again, Vanessa, for sharing with us and for really inspiring us to, to think in, in multiple ways about what we're experiencing, not only in the exhibition, but also in the art world and beyond. Thank you, our audience members, for joining us. We look forward to seeing you at future programs and maybe even someday soon in the museum. We hope you have a wonderful evening. Good night.